the when the, the column collapsed and the fire blew up, um, there was minutes. You know, we're making great decisions. We're we're on it. We're making great plans, and you could just see it in people's eyes that um, you know this was different. This was this was a different event. And some of the crews I know talking to them were were frustrated. They, you know, cleared six homes in a row and felt really good about it. And they turned around and home number two was on mm-hmm. fire. We were just like, okay, we, you know, it ran this way. You know, certainly it's not going to cross the continental divide. And then, of course, on October 22nd, the fire, these troublesome fire made its huge run, jumped over the continental divide. There was no doubt in my mind that the fire was going to come into Essex. So we got a smoke report out that we thought was in the park. And so we started doing a response at the same th- same time as the Forest Service started doing a response. So I wasn't too concerned until I flew over uh, Chapin Pass. And Chapin Pass is up at the head of Chapin Creek, kind of in the upper reaches of the Cascopooter drainage. Mm-hmm. And over that and my memory did not serve me until I flew over it to go, oh man, there, there is continuous fuels up and over. And if it gets up and over, that's where our Willow, Willow Park cabin is. Yeah. And that's Fall River drainage. So Fall River drainage of right into town, you know, it being so far away from anything, you know, the helicopter has this way to get there. But um, gosh, by the time the helicopter even got there to give a size up, um, you know, it was it was off to the races. Jumped across Highway 14, and I think then in August we realized there's nothing but continuous fuel between Highway 14 and the Estes Valley. And so we kind of already knew back then we were a little bit at the mercy of what was going to happen with the weather over the next couple of months. And and uh, hope is not a strategy is a saying that you, we hear often from Mike Llewellyn in, in Rocky Mountain National Park. And it was absolutely, but at that point, all we had was hope. Jumping forward to September, Labor Day weekend, we had the large wind events. It was another time that we knew there was nothing we could do about the fire where it was, other than hope that the snow got here in time. And and so all through Labor Day weekend, we have our trigger set up about if we're gonna need to evacuate, we're doing the same sort of structure triage that we did up on Highway 14, we're now doing in our own community. So the second week, I think it was, was when it made its second big push. It came into the park pretty fast. And then like, and then we got that big snowstorm, which is crazy. So it parked it for a while. And, and for us, even though we were watching the fire like a hawk for the next I don't know how many you know months. The fire really didn't move that much into Upper Chapin Creek, into the area that we were worried about. We did drop some um, helicopter water drops on that leading edge just to cool it down. We got the snow and the fire stopped and everyone was able to take a sigh of relief. And then come October, um, we, we saw that the fire had, had blown out of the Pingree Park area and was starting to move down towards Glen Haven and we we're watching Cameron Peak. And on mm-hmm. October 14th, we got the call that they needed to evacuate Glen Haven. So now our crews for Estes are all committed down in Glen Haven, helping them with evacuations, helping them prepare structures. Um, and then as the fire pushed into the retreat, helping fight the fire there. Estes Valley and Glenhaven have a, a very good working relationship. We're mutual aid partners. We train together. And having Chief Wolf as our strike force leader trainee was was a great thing because we knew we knew each other, we worked together well, and, and he knew how to deploy us. The first thing we did was assisted Larimer County Sheriff with the evacuation. But once we made sure all the residents were taken care of. We went in and did some rapid structure protection, which is basically 
Get as many combustibles as you can away from the house. Do some quick chainsaw work to, to get rid of some vegetation and then move on to the next house. Um, and then we actually foamed a number of homes. I think on October 14th, the uh, East Charleston started in uh, outside of the old park subdivision over near Kremlin. Um, you know, fires start small and those local resources on the ground are in charge of it. And, you know, it's that initial attack period. And so the 21st was the last day for the type two incident management team that had been here for three weeks managing. And it was a shadow day for the incoming type one team that was out of the Pacific Northwest. You, you know, usually when you're when you're going up in complexity with that next team coming in, one of their standard things is they just start ordering more resources. So more engines, more shock crews, things like that. I am a uh, public information officer. So I go out on wildfires across the country. That's just giving us a little background on what we were doing as a county before wildfire season happened. In June, went on fire assignment to the Bighorn Fire in Arizona. And right after that, I did a virtual assignment for um, the police fire in Arizona. And then I came back from that and the Williamsport fire had started. Because I'd worked for so long on fires, my friend, who's also a public information officer in Eagle County, we had plans to go to Florida for a little relaxation, R&R. Yeah. &R. And so we had our tickets and the East Troublesome Fire started on October 14th on a Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And the forest called and said, hey, can you come help us? And I said, I'm so sorry. I would love to, but I have a plane ticket. Yeah. And then I felt... Tremendous guilt because there was a fire in my county. And I was also working with the other under sheriff as far as, you know, evacuations and when we were going to hold mm -hmm. the trigger on some of those. And, you know, we already had Highway 125 evacuated and a lot of folks up 34 under pre evac. And, and honestly, at 5 30 in the afternoon and evening, we still felt pretty good that we were this fire. You know, just looking at the fire behavior the last few nights, certainly active overnight, but not a lot of growth overnight. And mm -hmm. So um, I left with my friend, and then um, that was on a Friday, and then on the next Wednesday, it blew up. Mm. Um, I'm in Florida. I am getting multiple phone calls from all all different people of, um, you know, where are you? Are you there? Um, how do we evacuate? Where should we go? Bombarding me with these questions because normally I would be the one providing you know a lot of information we are our neighborhood is the second one closest to rocky mountain national park so we were in evacuation zone s as in sam when they were really doing d earlier in that day 5 30 p.m my husband was watching the team briefing nothing to be alarmed about from that um video uh not not even what an hour later He's getting the calls from my daughter and myself saying, hey, you're in, under pre-evacuation. He's like, well, I just watched the briefing and there was no real you know, stuff going on and now you're in pre-evac. And it's like, okay, well, you know, pre-evacuation can take days sometimes, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it can be, you can be in that state for days. And I think that was kind of the thought on people's minds was that it could be days. When the, the column collapsed and the fire blew up, um, there was minutes. Nobody's seen that before, you know? It's just, it was, you know, it's one of those perfect storms, like everything lined up. What Jeff would say when he was at the house and he would look out, and like, obviously the, the weather was pretty warm for October. He saw the orange glow. He did not see any flames, but he saw the orange glow from afar. And he said that it sounded like the roaring of like a freight train. Because there was so little time, he was not able to pack anything. Wow. So he just took the dog and, and a, his clothes and just left. And you always, I mean, people think they're gonna be back. Oh, you know, yeah. we'll be back. But it, in those cases where you're not back, it's, it's pretty horrible. So our house sits on the top of a hill and right behind us is a golf course. So. You, Golf courses could be nice fire breaks, right? And then on front of us, we had our road, and on the other side of the road was marshy swampland, 
and then the Winding River Ranch. So this huge open space ranch, no trees. So we had we had a um, very large, heavy timber, solid log home. Yeah. Very hard to burn. When my husband is at home and I'm telling him, okay, well here's the deal. One of the first things you should probably do is go around the deck and take all the couch cushions off of any of the chairs that are there mm. because those, those are flammable and, and embers could fall and, and sure. burn. Basically what happened is that the wind blew giant chunks, giant embers ahead of the fire. Everything was preheated. You're going to start combusting even without you know direct flame impingement, right? But the, the, it's, it's the embers. I mean, that's what does it. it just, the embers just shower down and land on everything. If they're on your roof, if they're on your deck furniture, if they're, they go up underneath your deck. The other thing, too, I know people's windows burned out. So I'm guessing some, in some cases, if your window blew out and embers went inside your house, it burned from the inside out. We did not have that crown fire in our neighborhood because we had not that we didn't have a lot of trees. I mean, we had some lodgepoles left, but um, a lot of folks had you know, cleared most of them out. We had the regenerated ones, little, little ones. But um, so the engine block out of the car that was in the garage just melted onto the ground, and it formed this really cool, like almost like a sculpture, mm-hmm. and it hardened. Um, but um, our neighbor who owns the ranch said that if you have like porcelain toilets. It takes, I think he said, 3,300 degrees to, to turn it into nothing. So that I can't imagine how hot that fire was. Um, you know, all my jewelry was that was there, everything is gone, like, again, pulverized. And those things had, like, melting points of, like, 1,700 degrees. Um, so I mean, it, was, it was a hot, hot fire. You know, I think it was just a little bit before 7. The, uh, you know, just got really dark up there and the smoke column just really settled into the ground and the winds really picked up and uh, wasn't long before we were like, huh, something different is happening. You know, we need to get, we need to get some fire engines up here into, into trail. Uh, so, so we ended up kind of assigning our fire personnel to assist with evacuations and it turned out to be quite the evacuation. So, you know, really 16 miles of, of highway with a bunch of county roads off of it. You know, we were fortunate. A lot of folks took the pre-evacuation seriously, and you know, a lot of the livestock concerns and things like that had been taken care of days earlier. Um, we were also fortunate; it was October, and we weren't really in full um, tourism season. And pretty much from about I think seven o'clock to probably close to nine o'clock, um, you know, we we're just involved with these evacuations. So yeah, evacuation finished up, and I think it was actually probably about eight thirty. And from there, um, you know, we kind of went to work. Some of the crews I know talking to them were were frustrated. They, you know, cleared six homes in a row and felt really good about it. And they turned around and home number two was on fire. I I think as late as Friday, which would have been the 23rd, you know, I think is about the last home we lost. But we we lost, um, you know, 366 homes. uh, And I bet we lost 300 in... 30 of them, you know, in that first three hours of the, you know, of the blow up. So from all of them, you know, late in the evening on the 21st. So I find out about the house at about two o'clock in the morning and I get on the next airplane on Thursday morning. On the morning of the 22nd at 7 a.m., uh, I received a phone call saying, we think it's over the divide. At that point, the only evidence that we had was from a satellite uh, that that tracks heat, these heat signatures and was showing one pixel worth of heat on our side of the divide, um, which is not quite enough to start evacuating a community. Sure. And and we also knew that because of how much the wind can blow the smoke column over, that the signal in the satellite could be uh, embers in the smoke column. It doesn't mean it's fire on the ground. Okay. So uh, at 7 a.m., we knew we had the satellite evidence that there could have been fire, um, but it, we weren't ready to, to start evacuations yet. We, we wanted to get confirmation. So, so all right, regroup first thing in the morning. And, um, and so we all went to bed, <laughs> got a little bit of sleep. And uh, first thing in the morning, I get a phone call from the National Weather Service telling me, hey, our weather satellites are picking up a heat signature on the east side of the divide. And I'm just like, are you kidding? The East Troublesome Fire made its huge run 
jumped over the Continental Divide. It was about 10 or so. We had some firefighters hike up and they looked, they were able to go between the Ute Trail parking and uh, Forest Canyon. There's a spot there that you can look down at the junction of Spruce Creek. Mm. And so much fog that morning, as well as smoke coming in, that he couldn't see much, but there was one split instance that he was absolutely sure that he saw a column of smoke coming up on our side. And it wasn't, it wasn't way up Spruce Creek. It was way down. So the fire had obviously moved from the top of the divide way down Spruce Creek and onto Mount Wu. We pulled our crews out of Glenhaven, came back to Estes, and, and that's when we got, we had our confirmation that it had worked its way down and it started to run into the Fern Lake burn scar. Uh, it was around noon that we started our first evacuations of the Highway 66 corridor. When we were really talking about our specific plans for 2020, our hope was that we'd put uh, to voluntary evacuations. They'd be involuntary for at least two hours before we had to upgrade them to mandatory to give people that time that they needed to prepare to get their stuff together, to process what was happening, and and then to be able to safely move out. Uh, as anyone that was around that day realizes, it's not quite how it went. Our, our hand got forced a little bit, partly because of how far down the fire was by the time we were able to confirm it. There was so much smoke being blown down that we, um, by the time we confirmed it, it was already to Mount Wu, it was already to the Fern Lake burn scar. Um, one of the big stories of the East Troublesome Fire is the fog that came in that day. Um, the fog rolled in and, you know, the temperature kept dropping all day. And by that afternoon, it had froze. So we had freezing fog. And I think everybody can remember the red glow that day because of the combination of fog. The west side of the fire, or the west, yeah, the west side of the divide did not have the fog, and it was still burning. The satellite images just show this humongous smoke column coming on the 22nd. So that was, it was coming up over the divide at the same time we had the fog running into it, and that, that's what created that crazy red glow. We had sent into the park just to be eyes, and as it got dark, we had, uh, you know, our own employees had evacuated, even the firefighters. And we had, um, I think I came back to our fire office at about 1 a.m. Um, at that point, I got a call that, hey, we're starting to see orange glows in Moraine Park. Hmm. So about 2 a.m., I made it to Moraine Park. And sure enough, you could look up and you, can't, you couldn't tell where because the smoke was so thick. But you could tell trees were torching. But the, the good thing about that was it wasn't a wall of trees mm -hmm. torching. So at that point, I drove up to Trail Ridge Road again, um, for myself because no one could see where the fire was. But from Trail Ridge Road, I could look down at that, um, at that junction of Spruce Creek, and it looked like a boiling cauldron of lava. But I could just see these trees torching out. And... You know, 3 a.m., your mind plays tricks with you anyway. And the wind was blowing 60, 70 miles an hour. Like, I almost got my door blown off of my car. Um, and it it was just... So I get back down to the country market. And that's where the staging area was for the structure engines. And that's where Chief Wolf did a fantastic job of... That's where the network of firefighters that do whatever they can to help each other out. But there were a lot of engines from all around and they all came to help us out. And when I went into that group, there was a bunch of people that I knew. And it, you know, it's like you have your pleasantries and it's like, oh boy, we're sure in for it. But, but you can read the people's eyes and this was real. Once the fire reaches Eagle Cliff, it could cross town in four hours. We're doing the math of, all right, 30,000 people, it's gonna take us six hours to get everybody out of the way and the fire can cross town in four hours. Also having watched what the East Troublesome Fire did running 17 miles in a day, watching Cameron Peak have four events where it grew over 10 miles in a day. All that's in our head as we're making these decisions, hoping that we didn't make the call too late. There was no doubt in my mind that 
the fire was going to come into Estes and we were going to see structures burn and communities burn, have a tie to the community one way or another. And that's one of the things about Rocky that's that's a little different than a lot of other parks. And it's why I'm still here <laughs> is because Estes Park is such a great community. I, I don't want to get a, away from being a professional and treating this as an incident. But, but it is, it's, it's, it is personal. So there's a, there, of all the fires that I have gone on in my career, this one did feel more personal. That was a Thursday. So then uh, on Friday night, we obviously we've been monitoring this, you know, all through Friday day. Um, Friday night, I get a text from a friend who is out by the YMCA and sends me a photo of fire that they can see on the hillside. Uh, we drive down into the park and tie in with the night division that's responsible for Rocky Mountain National Park. We're all standing out here. It's like I said, eight, nine o'clock at night, the wind's blowing and we can't see the fire in the park, but this photo is pretty clear. Like fire is headed down this way. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we're expecting at this point that given the wind conditions, it was sustained around 40, 50 miles an hour, gusting to 70. We're expecting the fire to make a push down into town um, that night and, mm -hmm. and be in in a Highway 66 area by 6 a.m. All 37 of our volunteers were here in town and, and actively working this incident. And then we also started to put out our, you know, coordinating with the incident management team, we put out a call for, for more help. We knew that the amount of resources that we had wasn't gonna be enough for the firefight that we expected. And so we started using our mutual aid resources, our uh, pre-built relationships and further out to the point that we ended up with an additional 100 firefighters coming on. Uh, I'd have to check the sheet. I wanna say it was 34 or 36 engines that we got in addition to what the incident management team had. Most of our efforts were gonna be on the Highway 66 corridor, doing prep work on homes, you know, at that point, we assumed it was when the fire came in, not if the fire made it. So that's starting at two o'clock in the morning on Friday night into Saturday. And all day Saturday, we're dealing with the um, the high winds and the dry weather. And, and just we know snow's coming eventually. That's the forecast. But again, hope uh, hope's not the best strategy. So we'd rather have firefighters. Fortunately, on Saturday night, it started snowing um, and and things were starting to calm down. A lot more help had shown up. Uh, our firefighters for the Estes Valley had been going nonstop for about 48 hours. So we we had the relief and we're like, okay, everyone go home. Let's get some rest, and we'll you know we'll we'll be we'll be ready to take back over the next day. When it got light, we had scouts all over um, from from up in Windcliff, kind of getting a look up into the park. Um, trying to just see where is this fire. And we did get a report that, um, you know, the fire was on the backside of Mount Wu and that we should expect a major run coming towards the YMCA. Uh, the fire jumped into Moraine Park and started running up the, up the meadow there. The same, you know, that area burned in the Fern Lake fire where we actually did burn out of it. So uh, Hotshot Crew and some other folks they did a combination of direct line attack and burning out to um, to protect it, so that it cross Bear Lake Road and drop down by the old the old Dunraven. So by by being able to stop it in the meadow, that was huge. Um, the closer it got to Bear Lake Road, the bigger of a chance it would have had to kind of shove through there, and then you have a whole brand new set of fuels that it, it you know again probably would have made a pretty good run. I was at the farthest area in Upper Beaver Meadows, you know, just looking at the line that I, I just couldn't, I couldn't relax. I mean, I, I was just like, what is going to happen? The operator pulled up to me and he was kind of in a hurry. He's like, Mike, Mike, I got to tell you, man, if it wasn't for those fuels treatments, I don't know where this fire would be right now. And he took off. Mm -hmm. And that statement alone just brought me right down to her. I was just like, the fire stopped. combination of available fuel you've got mm -hmm. a dense forest along with the beetle kill it, within that dense forest you had a, a lot of uh, fuel with high ignitability and also high transfer capability you know dead trees tend to throw embers more embers and farther which accelerates the spread of the fire 
So you had the fuel conditions, your, your forest. You had the weather conditions with, uh, you know, very, very dry days, high winds, drought. And then it also seems like fire season just keeps getting longer and longer. We had a, we had things called like um, column collapse, like a large the column just, you know, gains all this momentum. And then when there's not enough oxygen, it just falls down and then it runs across. Mm. And the beetles kill trees right. are the issue. Right. Um, so that, by the intensity of the burn was in that fuel type, um, was not a good mixture with having a wind, you know, a wind and weather event and the beetle kill together. Was everybody kind of learning to deal with this COVID thing and the political aspects of all that? Uh, you know, just a lot of stress to start with. But I think most of us were living under uh, living under smoke clouds most of the summer. There isn't a fuel type like we're seeing around here anywhere else. And so it allowed it, it allowed the fire to make these huge runs because there's a combination of still green trees, which support a major crown fire, and you have all this dead and down that's on the ground. That stuff that's on the ground holds the heat. It's very unique in that, in that you can put in contingency lines, and if the fire's making a run, it's gonna spot a mile over it. The resistance to control is extreme. You can't really, in most places, put firefighters to cut line through all these dead and down logs and be successful to, to try to go direct on the line of the fire. Um, you know, certainly a lot of effort was put into doing just that. Uh, line after line got crossed just because of this, this unique fuel type that, that there's not much you can do with it. And of course, October is a bad time of year to try to get a lot of resources. You know, a lot of the federal resources are already uh, done for the summer. They're back to college. They're, you know, laid off their seasonal job. You know, for volunteers, it's uh, it's about community and it's about serving their neighbors. Well, I think what, you know, what's very effective in Glenhaven is the, the residents are hypersensitive. If they even think they see smoke anywhere, they, they call 911 immediately. You know, the problem is out on the Forest Service land or the National Park, something happened. We don't know exactly what yet that started that fire, but it was, it was caused by human activity. And, you know, that's remote. You're not always going to have eyes on that. Oh, the county will put a fire ban on. I've seen people start campfires and not be aware that there was a fire ban. And, you know, when you talk to them about that, they're very apologetic. But, you know, the, the genie's already out of the bottle at that point. Human-caused fires are less frequent than natural fires, like lightning strikes, but are more destructive. There's been more loss of life, more loss of property from human-caused fires than there have been from natural-caused fires. Planning in 2017 and 2019 really set us up for success. It also set us up to have a realistic expectation about what was possible. The, the mitigation work and the work we did to get FireWise recognized certainly was a help. We held a workshop for the residents on developing your own evacuation plan. And we had planned on doing that before the fire even started. When we held that workshop in August, uh, it was a pretty good turnout because people who hadn't already developed an evacuation checklist were certainly motivated to do so. So that helped too, because we had more people with evacuation checklists. You know, they had their go bags ready. And, you know, it, when we did have to evacuate, it went very smoothly. The amount of crews that you have and the amount of homes that you have to deal with determines how much time you get to spend on any house. If we have enough time, any house can be made defendable. We typically don't have the luxury of that time. We always encourage homeowners to do as much as possible. I can't tell you how happy it makes us when we come around the corner, we look at the house like, oh, this place is perfect. Like we, we move some lawn chairs, we move their grill and we're done. One neighbor whose fire burned all around their house, burned their shed down, but their house was fine. And she said, I will never regret taking those 28 loads of slash that we cut down to the slash pile. I saw homes where homeowners took mitigation seriously that are standing and occupied right now. Nearby was another home where that home unfortunately was lost because it was in dense forest and in the wrong place when the fire came in. We have things like uh, the slash collection yard 
that's operated by Boulder County down in the, the Meeker Park sort yard. So it's actually physically in Larimer County right near the border. But everybody in the Estes Valley can drop slash off there for free when they're open, which is usually like May to September, May to October. Yeah, I mean, we as practitioners know and realize that more money needs to be spent on mitigation. Everybody's paying attention now, right? They're like, oh my goodness, it happened. We lost 360 some homes here. Oh, the Grand County and other places are very challenging in the addressing realm. We do reflective address signs on our website. You can see it in the smoke, you can see it in, at night. Not only is it good for the wildfire, but it's good for medical emergencies. We do a cost share program that helps reimburse people for doing mitigation. We have a chipping program that's free chipping days throughout the county, and we do the address sign. You can go to assisvalleyfire.org slash wildfire, and there's a number of resources. Yeah, I hope these stories are a wake-up call for, you know, people in communities who haven't been impacted yet, but could be. You know, I look at what's going on here locally, which is you know, most of our agencies were running 50 to 100 calls a decade ago, a decade and a half ago. Now we're all running hundreds. I don't know that it's fair that the community expects one group of people to continually get up from the dinner table, continually drop their job and and go handle these problems. And we got a pretty dedicated group and they're up for the challenge, but I think it's a tough ask. I guess my story is just that we as a community probably need to find a better solution. And, you know, I, I hate to go straight to like a tax increase to cover it because, you know, those that are living here are already tapped out. Uh, but in Colorado, a, a fire district is not allowed to charge certain fees. We're not allowed to collect sales tax. It, it leaves us in a little bit of a box. You know, from my standpoint, it feels like we've got this smaller and smaller and smaller pool to handle a bigger and bigger and bigger population. In 2016, the Chimney Tops 2 fire started in Smoky Mountain National Park destroyed thousands of homes. Uh, there were fatalities associated with that fire. It moved incredibly fast. And because the fire started in a national park, National Park Service put together a, a, an investigative team to research it and look at it. And Mike Llewellyn, our local fire management officer, was part of that investigative team. So after investigating that fire, he came back to Estes and asked the question, could it happen here? Spoiler alert, yes. So starting in late 2016, early 2017, he and I sat down and started talking about, well, what would that look like here in the Estes Valley? How would we manage that? You know, a fire that started in the park and blew into the community. And, and we ultimately put together a workshop in 2017 that brought together everybody that emergency managers, everybody that might be associated with part of this response. We built some simulations where we started with a small 10 acre wildfire it was still very plausible. And this 10 acre fire that started around Eagle Cliff Drive would have blown all the way across Fish Creek in four hours. And so we had this common understanding of what the potential was. I think it all clicked how bad it could be. In 2019, we all got together again and sort of revisited it and said, okay, uh, we identified some gaps in our planning back in 2017. How do we do if we address those gaps in our response plans? And I think everyone had grand visions of working on that stuff in 2020. And then we had a pandemic that started in March and really took everyone's focus. But a lot of that planning that happened way back in 2017 is I believe what made us successful in 2020. Because when the fire started to threaten, we already knew what needed to happen. We already had all the connections and we had built all the relationships. We all knew each other because we had all talked through this together. So I knew what I could expect from the U.S. Forest Service, what I could expect from Allen's Park Fire, from Glen Haven Fire. And, and so we were all on the same page. We utilize our mutual aid with all of our fire districts. And so everyone's working together and they're familiar, familiar with each other. And our sheriff, obviously, because he's doing the evacuations and we're helping. So all the police, everybody in Grand County is just dialed. Like we're all working yeah. together. Yeah. And then we have a... Um, process put together called Mountain Area Mutual Aid. Mama. <laughs> so in your trouble, in your county, you call Mama. We, we basically, if you need Mama, we call Vail Dispatch and they will say, have the coordinator call Grand County because they need, they need help, all those counties. They all go to their list and they say, we can send you this, 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 and this. So they just send engines. So sure. it's a really great system. The public doesn't understand is the use of aircraft is great when you have people to follow it up. We only use it as a delaying tactic. Um, and in this case, it did work. That we've been, 
working on for years actually worked. <laughs> and being proud of, proud of our, uh, fuel, our fuel specialist. He has dedicated his career and he's very personal when it comes to wanting to protect lives and property. And, you know, just being proud for him. We have a lot of support from Larimer County. Larimer County is terrific. The Sheriff's Department, the Emergency Response Organization, all top-notch people. We, we have a lot of our command staff who still feel like we could have had our act together better on this or that, or we could have saved another home or two more homes. We, we can't let our people be too hard on themselves. You know, in, in, in what world should our folks be expected to live under a pandemic and tackle just wildland fire after wildland fire after wildland fire culminating into this 200,000 acre fire. You know, what world would would we expect perfection here? In this case, uh, I think we had one first responder injury in five days of operation. And it was a law enforcement officer who slipped on the ice and and broke his ankle. (laughs) You got to prioritize life over property. And I felt like we had a good balance there and we saved thousands of homes, <laughs> you know, and sometimes you just got to refocus the, you know, your people on, look, we would have loved to have done more, but we needed 400 more firefighters to do more. That wasn't available at nine o'clock that night. <laughs> I, I just, you know, the one thing that that stood out was the the dedication and the hard work by all the firefighters I saw. 